typical blood work that doctors would do and look at it from a bit of a different viewpoint. I've been studying with Dr. Ken Brockman and Jim Seema, who are doctors that were to look at blood work and reinterpret it more towards a nutritional or physiological viewpoint rather than pathology. So I could look at a blood test and tell you what glands or organs were deficient in certain vitamins and whatnot, which was a brand new thing back in those days. Nowadays, they have computer programs that do that. We can get this commercially online if you want to have it done. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers, because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button, and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running, and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and working on a product to help people overcome these problems, because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Dr. Michael Biamonte. He's the founder of the Biamonte Center for Clinical Nutrition. He's also a co-creator of BioCybernetics and author of Candida Chronicles. So we're going to talk about uh, the microbiome and what Candida is and some supplements and testing and uh, therapies for it. So, Mike, thank you for coming. Hey, no problem. My pleasure. If you would tell me a bit about your background and then what your current focus is today and how you got here. I went to naturopathic school back in 1984. When I was in naturopathic school, my specialty was being able to study blood work, typical blood work that doctors would do and look at it from a bit of a different viewpoint. I'd been studying with um, Dr. Ken Brockman and Jim Seema, who were doctors that were looking able to look at blood work and reinterpret it more towards a nutritional or physiological viewpoint rather than pathology. So I could look at a blood test and tell you what glands or organs were deficient in certain vitamins and whatnot, which was a brand new thing back in those days. Nowadays, they have computer programs that do that. We can get this commercially online if you want to have it done. But back then, it was I was the one actually who had the idea to do it on a computer, put all the research data that I had on the computer so you could feed the computer the blood work and then have it print out an analysis and then everything the person needed to take. Yeah, so I ended up talking about this in a lot of health food stores that I went to where I was lecturing. It would normally take me like about an hour to study someone's blood work and do a full report that's looking at it manually. So I wanted a computer that would do this. I bumped into a health food store in Massapequa where the person told me that they knew of a nutritionist in the area who already had a computer set up to do this. And they gave me the person's number, so I called the person, and it ended up that this person was an aerospace physiologist who was working for Grumman. And this was the person actually who had developed the life support systems on the lunar module. So I went to meet this man and we became fast friends. I worked with him for about 10 years, helping him develop, well, actually it was five total that we worked on it. But our professional relationship went on for 10 years or so. And what ended up happening was we had this model now of the computer body that was done in, it's called page-driven, tablet-driven type of computer language. And the reason why they choose this table-driven language was because every time we'd find out something new about the body, rather than having to rewrite the whole program, you could just insert a new table into the, the programming or move tables around if you found something different or something needed to be modified. So we had this program. It was working really well. We would feed it the results of blood tests, urine tests, even hair and mineral tests. And it would print out like a whole simulation of the person's body, what their body was doing right or wrong. And then it would tell us what kind of nutritional supplements they needed to take in order to fix whatever the, the error was. So we were using it 
and we had quite a few doctors using it as well. It was originally intended to be used on the astronaut for, in the space station, but we actually had the model to be to be able to use privately as well. Grumman and NASA then scratched us because they thought we were spending too much money on research, uh, consulting other doctors, having doctors fly in, putting them up in hotels, you know, to all work on this like a think tank. So we were left with this this computer, and we asked them, what we what do we do with this now? And they said, keep it. So we took the program and made it commercially available to a lot of doctors. We used it in our own practice. And we were having people with all kinds of ailments come to us, and the computer was helping them through this mode of biological medicine where it was correcting their nutritional imbalances. We ran it. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah the thing is, uh, even today, I'm only one person I know, but my experience and the experiences I've heard from a lot of people on the podcast is most doctors still don't do this. No, you know, you have a level of X and Y. If you're one point within that range, you're fine. If you're one point out of that range, you're bad. Well, the basic, the basic way that you, we do this and is still true today. We take the reference range, and we have a, a very easy mathematical equation that we throw, we throw it through. So let's say you're looking at your blood test, and the blood test says your alkaline phosphatase should be somewhere between 40 and 120. What we do is take the 40 and the 120 and add it together so we get 160. Then we divide it by 2. And that gives you 80. And then we go plus or minus 10 on either side. So 80 would be the perfect score. Plus or minus 10 on either side would be the buffer ranges. And then when you go out of that plus or minus 10, that would be a range where nutritionally you'd be very imbalanced. Then there would be yet another range, which would be the existing medical range that you would use for pathology if the test was uh, that abnormal. Well, what about the interaction? You know, if I get a blood test and I get 100 factors looked at, how do you, does the computer... I'm sure it does. It knows, okay, if I have low uh, inadequate and a lot of isthenophils and, you know, my liver enzymes are elevated, blah, 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 all these things interact and it shows you more of a picture of what's going on? Or does it the, 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 computer, the computer actually has over 1,600 algorithms that it uses between and, multiple blood tests, multiple levels of minerals or toxic metals in the hair, and parameters in the urine that it thinks with. And the, the computer is based on artificial intelligence. So the computer continues to educate itself. The, the more times it's been used and the more experience it gathers, it starts to then make suggestions to us in terms of what we should, uh, how we can adjust it or add things to it permanently. The computer also has a retest module where every time a person comes in, the computer looks at what supplements it gave you in the past and it then decides whether or not you need to stay on them or get off them. So let's say theoretically if a person came in the first time he was tested and the computer said he needs vitamin C. The next time if he comes in after taking the vitamin C, that need is gone, the computer would take you off the C. But now the third time you came in, if the computer finds that that need came back, it would then go back and put you back on the vitamin C. What about drug-induced nutrient depletion? You know, if someone's on a statin and this, that, and the other, and, you know, how does that affect their levels unnaturally and how do you account for that? Well, we give the compers we give the computer that data. The computer has another module that is it's, we call it the drug interreaction module. So, if the computer sees you're on a statin, then it will automatically look at your levels of CoQ10 and DHEA and all these other things which the statin could affect, and it would then prescribe um, correctly based on that. Oh, that's excellent. However, that's not the story. That's not really the story. The, okay. the true story begins with with this events or set of circumstances after we were using the computer for about two years we started noticing about 30 percent of the people had crazy reactions to the vitamins and when we questioned them about their reactions to foods and drugs it was the same thing they were intolerant or just had weird reactions so i volunteered to find out what was wrong with these people and after studying their blood tests i determined they had some kind of imbalance in their biome now this is 1986 it wasn't that much known about the biome really back then. But I had these people do stool tests. And back then we had a lab that was called Great Smokies. They were in North Carolina. And they later became Genova Labs, which is now one of the leading labs in functional testing. Well, we found out from doing these stool tests, these people had candida. So this to show you how, how ignorant and naive I was back then. I met with these patients and I told them, the reason why the vitamins and the program's not working for you is you have candida. Now you have to go to your medical doctor and tell him you have candida, have him cure you and then come back. 
And the stories I heard, the stories I heard from these people were incredible. One, some of the doctors had fits. They they went they went nuts in the office yelling at them. Other ones said there's no such thing as candida. Other doctors said everybody has candida. It's normal to have it. It was all, all kinds of stories. So I knew that wasn't going to work. So what I did was I referred them to most of these patients to Ronald Hoffman in, in New York and to Robert Atkins, the famous uh, famous Dr. Atkins. Because oh, I, you know, oh, I, yeah, because I knew these guys personally, and I knew that they knew what candida was. So this was a better response. The patients came back to me and said, this was great. They didn't tell me I was crazy. They they gave me the uh, diet. They gave me medicines, and I started to feel better. And But after a couple yeah. of months, it stopped, and it all started coming back. And as a matter of fact, they then raised the doses of the medicines higher, and every time they went higher on the medicines, I felt worse. Well, before so, we move on, yeah. please tell people what candida is and what the symptoms and the effects are. Absolutely. Candida is the, the organism we found that was overgrown in these people is a fungus that's normally found in your intestinal tract, but it's found there in only small amounts. It's also the yeast that causes vaginal yeast infections in women and causes other like type of jock and groin infections in men. It's considered a dimorphic organism, which means the dimorphic means able to live in two different states. So candida can switch itself like a chameleon from a yeast back to a fungus and then vice versa. Candida is kept under control in your intestinal tract, and its amounts in there are limited by the actions of friendly probiotics. Probiotics, to some degree, use the candida as a food, but the probiotics also suppress its growth so it remains in small amounts in your intestines. If anything happens to disturb your biome and your friendly bacteria there, the probiotics, the candida begins to grow out of control, and it starts to become a dominant part of your intestinal flora rather than a minor part. When candida grows out of control, it releases tons of toxins into your body. It releases mycotoxins, which are toxins that are derived or, or that stem from molds or fungus. It releases alcohols in your body because candida, being a yeast, ferments sugars and, and uh, carbohydrates. So just like you would make beer or you would make wine, this yeast in your intestinal tract will ferment the sugars that you eat and convert them to alcohol. Yeah, I heard of the case um, where a guy was arrested for GUI and he, he had a very high BAC, but he didn't drink anything. And I get there, he had a uh, brewery. Japanese, there's a Japanese strain of candida, which is rare but does occur, which converts alcohol to such in such a high amount that people, yes, have been found legally intoxicated, even though they didn't have a drop to drink. But it would happen particularly if they eat a lot of sugar, because it's the sugar that gets fermented in the alcohol. So how common is candida, people? About 30% of the U.S. population probably has it at any time. That's a very conservative conservative estimate. Candida is caused by anything that disturbs you about your natural biome. So anything that will kill your probiotics will cause candida. So this includes antibiotics as usually the number one thing because antibiotics don't discriminate. They don't just kill the bad bacteria, they kill the good. Different hormones will do it, like prednisone, cortisone, estrogen hormones will do it. If you take too many antacid pills like Tums or Rolaids or any kind of proton pump inhibitor, the lack of stomach acid allows the candida to grow. If, you, if you're in chlorinated water and you happen to drink too much of the water accidentally, the chlorine will kill the friendly bacteria. If you have a surgery, or a surgery is almost guaranteed to cause it because they're going to give you lots of antibiotics, but even if you're in an accident, if you have any trauma to your body, that shock could kill the friendly bacteria in your gut. So these are the most common things that cause it. Usually when a person's biome gets knocked out, the first thing they start to feel is fatigue, and they start having memory problems. They start forgetting things. Then they start noticing digestive problems. They get constipated. They get bloating. They get gas. Then they can start developing asthma or eczema. Then as it, as it gets increased, they can become very allergic to food or very allergic to their environment. They can even become highly chemically sensitive to the point where they can't be around anybody who's wearing perfume or smoking a cigarette or something. They just can't. They get chemically overloaded by those things. Eventually, yeah. the person can develop leaky gut syndrome which is a condition where the candida damages your intestinal tract and it causes microscopic tears or, in some cases, excessive, excessive degrees of porousness of your intestinal tract. And the bottom line is when you develop leaky gut, things enter your bloodstream that normally would never be allowed to. 
the natural barrier in your intestinal tract would stop things from entering. Now, that could be undigested food. It could be bacteria. It could be anything, but it will enter your bloodstream and then further overwhelm your body. So this is uh, essentially what candida is and how it behaves. Many people can spend years and years and years trying to figure out what's wrong with them because candida can literally produce 150 different symptoms that could appear all disrelated. Just as I've gone over in the chronological time list I gave you here, if you started to get gas and bloating and then at the same time you started to get asthma or eczema, you would never put those two things together. But here you have a case where they're all caused by the same thing. And candida can be influenced by your diet, changes in your hormones, changes in your sleep, by the weather. There's so many things that can influence it that it will also cause the symptoms to change. And again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't connect it unless you were really keeping detailed notes on everything in your life. Like, for yeah. instance, in the summer, when it's very humid, candida gets worse because of the high humidity, just like any other fold organism or mold would get worse. People who have mold in their house and who have candida would be the people in the house that react the worst to that environment. Mm. Because whenever, you, whenever you're dealing with a sick building syndrome or a mold in the house, usually when you go there and you interview the people, you're going to find there's one or two people that's really heavily affected and some others are only right. minor or not affected at all. And it's the person who has candida that's the most affected when you go to those situations. Okay, so I guess candida is always there, but when we have a dysbiosis, when we have something out of whack caused by a drug or other conditions, now it's allowed to proliferate, and now it causes this problem. Yes, and when it, when it reaches the point of dysbiosis, this means that the person has an imbalance between the sum total aggregate of all the good organisms versus the bad. So you're going to find that the person with candida at this point has candida, which also is also contains or... They're sort of huddled together with mycobacteria and with different parasites. So you'll have a, a true dysbiosis is where the person has multiple pathogens. And unfortunately, it, when you get these multiple pathogens, the mycobacteria produce biofilm, which hides them all. And it makes it very difficult to detect that you have this or difficult to treat it because it's being protected by that biofilm. Yeah, no, it makes sense. What are some of the treatments for candida that you've uncovered? Most of the treatments fail, and I'll explain why. The first line of, of defense or the first treatment that usually people are exposed to are drugs like niastatin, Spornox, or ketoconazole. And the problem with these drugs is that doctors prescribe them for weeks at a time. And after candida is exposed to any herb or any drug for longer than 21 days, it begins to mutate. And it begins, it begins to become drug resistant, and it switches species. Instead of it being Candida albicans, which is the most common form, it will become Candida tropicalis or Gelbrata, which are more advanced species, which are more drug resistive. So after 20, this explains why those patients years ago, when the doctor gave them the drugs, they got better and then they started getting worse again, is because their strains of Candida were developing a drug resistance to the medicine. The next thing right. people will encounter is herbal treatments. Herbal treatments and all natural treatments follow the same rule. If you take them longer than 21 days, the candida mutates and they're no longer effective. Many people try to handle with candida with diet. Sorry? Okay, okay go ahead. I was going to say, but um, what? So candida is able to alter itself to, you know, to avoid these treatments. Yeah. You know, I'm probably preempting you. Let's continue. So how do you get rid of it? Well, but go back, going back on that specifically, most forms of candida can be found in two categories, mother cells and daughter cells. The mother cells are the older like branch of the candida, and the daughter cells are the new budding cells. The mother cells are able to import DNA in, uh, messages, let's say, to the daughter cells, telling them how to avoid being killed by this drug. And that's essentially how the resistance works. Um, diet, I was just mentioning. Right. Most people try to use diet to get rid of the candida, which is impossible to work, because the candida, being a vegetation, grows roots. And these roots that it grows permeate your intestinal tract and go into the tiny blood vessels to draw glucose out. So even if you are fasting, you couldn't totally get rid of the candida. Some of it would still remain alive. And then once you go back to a regular diet or a diet with any significant amount of carbs or sugars, the candida grows right back, just like a weed. Okay. So again, how do you get rid of it? When you read my book, The Candida Chronicles, 
I take you through, actually, the reason it's called the Candida Chronicles is because it chronicled my journey of understanding Candida and, uh, and trying to understand all the tricks that it would play on you and how to outsmart it. So one of the first things that I learned about treating Candida is that you have to rotate the antifungals that you take. If you have, you can't take them every day. So in my in my program or protocol, we have two systems. One is where we rotate the antifungals every four days, and another is where we rotate them every seven days. So that's the first thing. To stop candida from becoming drug resistant, you have to rotate the antifungals. The next thing you have to learn is that you don't waste your money with probiotics in the beginning of the treatment because candida repels probiotics. As long as a person has candida, the probiotics are never going to stick and never going to get the candida out of there. You have to get the candida reduced first, then the probiotics will be able to stick to the intestinal tract. But until you get rid of the majority of the candida, the candida is just going to repel the probiotics and they'll never do anything that's helpful. Once you get the probiotics back, they do help your digestion and they help you from not... That they help uh, stop the candida from overgrowing again in the future, providing you don't get hit with antibiotics again. But that's that's the trick with probiotics. It's actually the companies that sell probiotics and tell you to take them for candida are actually lying to you, because what they're not telling you is that the probiotics won't re-inoculate your intestines until you get rid of the candida. The next problem you run into with treatment of candida is supplements. There's a handful of supplements that actually make candida worse. Coenzyme Q10, if you take it and you have candida, it will make your candida worse. Iron supplements will make your candida worse. Vitamin D will make your candida worse. Copper supplements will make your candida worse. And very often, calcium also makes the candida worse. Now, the reason why these vitamins, oh, and by the way, B-complex vitamins, if you consume B-complex vitamins at the same time that you eat any kind of starch or carbohydrate, that will also make the candida worse. There are other vitamins that there are other vitamins that stop the antifungals from working. We call them an anecdotes. Any antioxidant, just to keep this simple, any antioxidant nutrient that you take, whether it's a mineral, a vitamin, or whatever, if you take it while you're trying to kill candida, it will nullify the effects of the antifungal. And this is why. Most antifungals antifungals and antiparasitics are technically categorized as chemotherapy. And any chemotherapy seeks to create oxidative stress against the membrane of the substance you're trying to kill. So when you're trying to kill cancer with chemotherapy, the chemotherapy creates oxidative stress against the cancer cell in trying to kill the cancer cell. The same thing is true with candida or killing parasites. The the herbs or the medicine is trying to create oxidative stress against the membrane of that organism to kill it. Now, when you take antioxidants, the antioxidants stop the oxidative stress, so they literally act as an antidote to the to the remedy you're taking you're taking to try to kill the candida or the parasite. Okay, so to recap, what is the proper protocol that you see? How do you get rid of the candida first? As you, it sounds like you stop taking certain supplements if you are yes. taking them. That's so one of the. Go through it. Yep, that's one. And my when you read my book, we take you through phase zero, one, two, three, and four, and the sequence of how you handle the candida. It has been proven in the last 30 years, time after time, to be the correct sequence. The first thing we do with the person is we give them a bowel cleanse that helps eliminate the surface layers of candida and parasites and harmful bacteria. And the products that we use all work mechanically. They don't work like a drug or an herb. They work in a physical manner to bind to the organisms or physically dislodge it so that it's taken out. So that's right automatically giving you a cleaner slate to work with. The next thing we do is we put them on the rotated herbs. The first set of herbs that we give them to rotate, the herbs are rotated every four days. We usually give them four. or So that would mean that going through those once would be 16 days. And we have them repeat that cycle until we see evidence in the testing that we do that that candida is better. Now, those herbs that we use are herbs that kill candida systemically. They kill it in, in the bloodstream, in the lymph system, all through the body. The next thing, which is probably the most important thing, is the, is the second phase. That was just the first I described. The second phase is where we use fatty acid-based antifungals to kill the candida deep in the intestinal lining. The candida that's deep in the crevices of your intestines is the candida that stops the probiotics from being able to return. So we put the person on these rotated antifungals for seven days each until we have gotten rid of that candida, and then we put them on a probiotic program which contains uh, different prebiotics along with the probiotics to get the candida to grow again. Now, if the person has leaky gut, before we put them on the probiotics, we have to heal the leaky gut. 
and that could add three to four months to the treatment. But you cannot give somebody who has leaky gut probiotics, they're going to have bad reactions to the probiotic. When we've done all that, we can conclude that the person's gut biome is back to normal. So the next thing we want to look at is what could possibly make this person relapse again. Well, we know that chemical toxicity and metal toxicity can cause candida to grow back, even if the person is careful with their diet and they're taking their probiotics and they're avoiding antibiotics and et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing we do is a hair mineral test to look for toxic metals. And we do a test that's called the oats test, which tells us if the person's being exposed to any chemical toxins or and also how well they detoxify. When we have handled any toxicity issue, the next thing we do is run them through the, the biocybernetic system so that we can rebalance all their hormones, all their vitamins, all their amino acids, their neurotransmitters. We get basically all their levels back to normal. And very often when a person finishes that part, they feel better than they ever did in their entire life because wow. this is the first time that they don't have any deficiencies or imbalances. So then the last step... We, long... Sounds okay. very good. Go ahead. Well, the last step that we do, if needed, and many times that's not even needed by we get to this point, is handle any immune deficiency they have. So we check different immune factors in their body, and if we find their immune system is underactive, then we give them different Chinese herbs and different North American herbs that help to stimulate and reboost the immune system and help them produce antibodies and the I, all the IgGs and whatever is needed. Interferon is another thing we have to look at. So we basically look at all the components of their immune system and make sure everything is firing correctly. And then that's the that would be the end right there. Now you, here you have a person who you literally we just put back together. How long is this protocol and what are some of the milestones that the person will have to do? Like, excellent. What are milestones again? How long does the protocol take? It's usually a year, a year to a year and a half, depending on what's going on. If they have leaky gut, you can tack on three to four months to heal the leaky gut. If they have toxic metals, like elevated levels of copper or mercury, that could take another six months, and in some case a year just to handle by itself. Metals are oh, a wow. very dangerous thing. Besides candida, one of the things in health that's very overlooked, and it's it's actually a sin that this is this is the way it is, is toxic metals. Most I would go out on a limb to say that most people who are suffering from chronic ailments have a toxic metal in their system that's actually at the root of it. I don't care how many prescriptions their doctor gives them to cover up the symptoms, they're not getting to the cause. The cause very often is some kind of extreme toxic metal issue. Toxicity of lead, of mercury, of arsenic, of nickel, of iron, of copper, cadmium, all of these metals build up in your system. You 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 acquire them sometimes through your drinking water. If the pump if the plumbing is old and starts to leach lead or 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 copper or iron from the pipes or the fittings. If you have a well, you can get manganese toxicity, iron toxicity, copper toxicity. There's various I'll give you another example. People who live in the Midwest, Colorado, New Mexico. Nevada. These people, when we test them, typically have very high levels of uranium. Now, this is not this is inert uranium. It's not radioactive, but but uranium, even though even when, if it's not radioactive, still can create all kinds of illnesses and imbalances in your body if it builds up. And because those areas I just mentioned, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, they were involved with heavy nuclear testing, and that uranium is still there in the soil. And there are oh, many wow. people, many people get it. They're, they're, it becomes a contaminant. People who eat kale from the Midwest are often very high in beryllium and, and barium because that, that kale in the Midwest absorbs that metal from the soil, and those are also toxic metals. So it, it goes on and on how I could describe all this, but the bottom line is I would challenge people with chronic illness to, to have themselves have to tested for heavy metals because... 88 out of 10 of them are going to find that the heavy metal is actually the underlying root of their disease. It's not that they have a deficiency of whatever the drug the doctor is giving them. Yeah. But what are some of the most common reasons people give you for why they've come to you? Well, most of them have heard me on a podcast at some point somewhere. Because at one point, I did 70 solo podcasts that are on my website nice. that are on YouTube. And I'm, I'm a frequent guest on podcast shows like yours. So a lot of them have heard me talk about this, and they start recognizing the symptoms. Or they've had a doctor or a friend tell them 
to look into candida. And very, very often these people sit down and they think, when, do, when did these symptoms start to appear? And sure enough, they'll... Yes. But let's reiterate it. What are the top symptoms in the eyes, in, 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 you know, per the description of the patient themselves? You know, how do they tell you what's what's bugging them when they call? They have they have fatigue. They have cognitive problems. They have bad di very bad digestive issues, bloating, gas, constipation. They have allergies, and very often all these illnesses came within a brief period of time altogether. Mm -hmm. Allergies. Okay. They're chemically intolerant. A lot of them come in. They say I have problems, which which uh, is nothing new. It sounds like it's new, but it's actually not. Mast cell problems have been going on forever. Um, and that's one of the common things that occurs in someone with candida. Very often we get patients with COVID. They, they're, they're, they're thinking it's, lo it's something called long COVID. Actually isn't the case. Candida is caused by COVID. If someone gets COVID, there's a very, very high chance that that COVID is going to cause candida to overgrow in their body. And in addition to that, the COVID vaccines cause candida in people. So someone who's been vaccinated heavily or someone who gets COVID also gets candida. People with Lyme disease are treated heavily with antibiotics for the Lyme disease, and it gets very confusing for them because the doctor will test them for Lyme. They do the antibiotic treatment. The doctor tests them again and says, well, your Lyme is gone. But they say, but I still feel bad. I have my symptoms have changed. And why it's changed is by the antibiotics, but the antibiotics then caused candida. Okay. In addition to candida, what are uh, what's like the most prevalent problem that you see people have, or is candida so pervasive that it really crowds out everything else? Well, I'm a I'm a specialist for candida, so the majority of the people who come to me have been fighting with candida for ten years, and they usually know more about it now than half the doctors that they're seeing. So they'll seek me out as a specialist. So I guess that question is sort of unfair because it's a, I have a, a very targeted, um, let's say, population of people who are coming to me. Okay, makes sense. Um, with the computer modeling, I know you specialize, but the computer modeling sounds incredibly useful. Do you license it out to other practitioners? Or, you know, what if you're, you get someone that is not in the candida realm? You still use the computer program to, you know, to advise yeah. them what to do. But um, that would be the first thing we do. Yeah, that would be the first. If they have someone comes with heart disease or diabetes, or they come with some chronic degenerative disease, if it's not candida related, the first thing we do would be to put them through that system to find out what their imbalances are and what potential toxicities they have. And usually, the the first thing you end up dealing with in the person is toxicities. They're either exposed to chemical toxicities. They're either toxic from the medication that they're taking, or they've, they've acquired uh, toxic metals. So um, usually, and most people who come to me, their treatment begins with some kind of a detox program to get rid of the environmental toxins, the drug accumulations in their body, or the toxic metals. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. How good is the computer program now? You've been working with it for, what, like almost 40 years? So give, me like, yeah, give you an example. We had a patient come to us, and the computer pinpointed that there was a deficiency of certain trace minerals in their brain, in a certain part of the brain called the globus pallidus, which is where one of the areas that lithium works in the brain. The computer pinpoints this, and then, it, and then it also said because of this, their hypothalamus was malfunctioning, and the hypothalamus wasn't correctly balancing their pituitary and the rest of their endocrine system. Well, we, we told them this. That they didn't believe this. They said, well, this can't be true. How can you figure this out like this? I've been to all these doctors all over the world. So they ended up going to the Mayo Clinic, and they spent six months there getting tested. And at the end of the six months, the doctors told them, we think there's something wrong with your hypothalamus gland, but we're not sure what it is or why. Okay. So there you go. Hey, Michael, sorry, I lost you for uh, about three or four seconds. Would you mind repeating answer hypothalamus gland, and they don't know why? When... Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so, the, so the doctors were able to detect something were wrong with their hypothalamus, but they couldn't pick up on why it was or what else it was doing. So there's, there's a comparison of what doctors for six months at the Mayo Clinic were able to come up with compared to the computer that analyzed their, their uh, tests for about 10 minutes. Hmm. Very interesting. So I guess you'd say the computer modeling is incredibly powerful. It, uh, it alerts you to things that... Uh, do you feel like you would be able to draw any of the same conclusions, no matter how much knowledge you have, or 
how much of a, a higher level of analysis or deeper level does the computer uh, program perform that you're using? Well, the, as I said, the computer has 1,600 algorithms. For me to for me to go through that, I have to sit down with their with their lab work and with a, a a printout of all the algorithms and go through them manually. That usually takes a couple hours. The computer does it in in ten minutes or less. Hmm. Okay. Is there? I mean, almost always there's people that no one can help. Perhaps it's because the person's not telling you that you know what they're accurately doing or other reasons. But um, what would you say is the uh, percentage of people that for some reason, you just can't figure out what's going on with them. It's about 20%, and we know what's going on with those people. We've investigated it fully. I made it a hobby to figure out why 20% couldn't get well, regardless of what we did. And we found out that one, one way or another, you could say they had too much stress. You could call it stress. It, if you want to call it stress, you can then categorize it in noncompliance, people who just didn't do the program for whatever reason. They said they did, but they actually didn't. They altered it right. or didn't do it. Then you have other people who are under so much stress that their cortisol levels just skyrocket, and then their 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 body's effect from the stress is just too much for it to overcome. So, what if someone has that? Uh, you know, I know if you're not promising any cures or anything, but what if someone has cancer and you specialize in candy and they want to? You know, it would be helpful for them to have uh, this computer program analyzing them. But again, that's not your specialty. Like, what what do you do with those people? We just run them through all the we run them through all the uh, the testing to find out what's happening with them, and then we we try to uh, correct as much as we can. The problem with cancer is it's very political. It's been this way since the '80s. Nutritionists or alternative doctors who claim to treat cancer are clay pigeons for for the um, the medical let's say the medical industry. I'm not going to call it the medical profession. I'm going to call it the industry. The last thing that that the medical industry wants is somebody who can actually cure somebody. In the medical industry, they have a, a, a saying. First thing you do is never kill the patient. The second thing is never cure them. Because if you cure them, they're not going to be there to buy your drugs and your medicine. It's illegal in many states to say you can actually cure a disease. So this environment doesn't really lead towards most health practitioners getting very vocal or becoming very active in dealing with something like cancer. When COVID was at its peak, as an example, when COVID was at its peak, I'm political at all. Oh, no, and I, I know this, but I'll just give you this example. When COVID was at its peak, I was working with a, a, a laboratory that I still work heavily with. They're called Way Labs, and they make the, the finest Chinese herbal medicines that you can find anywhere. They use American-grown ingredients, so they're not the they're not the, the herbs and from China that potentially have toxic metals and toxins. They're they have very good quality control. The Way Labs and myself we put together several COVID protocols, and with we were able to get the person free and clear of COVID within three to five days, and handle all their symptoms that were occurring. Well, we had hundreds of people doing these protocols, and they were all writing success stories, saying how the doctor said they had COVID, they took this stuff, and in a few days they were much better, and they haven't had any reoccurrence. We put this information on our website. Now, this wasn't anything I was saying. This is people writing in saying, wow, this guy really helped me. This is what he did. The, the Federal Trade Commission started sending me letters threatening me with jail, and with hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines if I didn't take this stuff off my website. Yeah, I don't believe it. it was, I wasn't the only one I found out. I found out they had an entire list of about 100 doctors and 100 different vitamin companies that they all were doing this with because they, they didn't want anybody, I guess, um, interfering with how it was coming down, so to speak. Right. So do other doctors have this computer program, or is it really... Kept in house by you guys. Yeah, it's in house, in house by us. And okay. the doctors can send reports, and then then we um we have a fee we charge them for running the report. There you go. Okay, but if someone um is not feeling well, whatever that means to them, and you know they don't know if it's candida or not, should they should they shy away from contacting you, or anytime someone is not at their optimal health, where they feel should they contact you, or only if it it sounds like candida is affecting them. 
No, anybody can. We we handle. We still do handle general nutrition. I specialize in candida, but I'm really in what I really do, to be honest with you, is clinical ecology. That technically would be my field in in healthcare is clinical ecology. Clinical ecology is where you study the environment and its effects on the person's health. And why I say clinical ecology is because I'm dealing with environmental toxins of all kinds. And I'm dealing also part of clinical ecology or your environment or drugs that doctors give you. Iatrogenic disease is doctor-induced. It's from medications, side effects of medications. And that does fall into clinical ecology. I call doctors uh, idiopaths because they always say, I don't know, I don't know. I hope, you know, that might have, well, I have a friend of, I have a friend of mine who's an MD who says that MD stands for mental deficient. Oh, so that's even arch, but Well, very good. Uh, Michael, what's, so what's the name of your book? Where can they get it, people? And then uh, how can they contact your office for help? My book is called The Candida Chronicles. You can find it on Amazon.com, just like you can find everything else in the world on Amazon. And you can, um, if, if someone is interested in contacting me for whatever reason, they can do so through my three websites. The first website is my main website, which is health-truth.com. That's www.health-truth. The second two, uh, the second websites I have were kind of secondary that are related to that main one, or the New York City Candida Doctor and then the New York City Thyroid Doctor. So they can contact me on any other reason why, by the way, why the New York City Thyroid Doctor is because uh, candida and thyroid are so related. Probably one of the major side effects you get from candida is eventually it affects your thyroid. And we know how to handle that and reverse that in people. Uh, well, very good. Well, Michael, Dr. Biamonte, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it very much. My pleasure. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.